Well, if you have your uh, bulletin there, there are some sermon notes to follow along. I wanted us to just see that, see that shape of the tabernacle and kind of get that in our brains for these first few weeks as we get acquainted with the, the words we might read, but the images that probably best capture a pretty, pretty decent facsimile of what we're talking about when it comes to the tabernacle. And the study we continued in, we're going to be in the book of Exodus, starting in uh, chapter 25 with verse 9. We'll back up one verse just to sort of uh, hook from last week. But as I was studying this week, I stumbled down a rabbit trail on a term that I, I, I had heard before but didn't understand. Who knows what the over-under is? Anyone? Right. Nobody knows what the over-under is. Some, some might not want to admit it because it has to do with sports betting. Uh, but it's a gambling term, so it's like, I don't want to admit I know what the over-under is. I had heard people talking about it in relation to sports, but of course, it's me, so I really didn't. I was, I was a few steps away from understanding that, just by the nature of sports. But uh, an over-under bet is a wager in, in a... The sports book will predict, stay with me here, they'll predict a number for a given game. I'm not talking about one team or the other team, I'm talking about total. Like if, if the Seahawks are playing, playing somebody and the score at the end is 24-17, what would the total be? 41, thank you. So they predict 41 is going to be, the, that, that's going to be the, the, the cumulative score. And so then people bet either it's going to be more than that or it's going to be less than that. Right? So, so you're like, okay, over, under. So it doesn't really matter even who wins. It doesn't matter who scored the more points. Just whatever that total is, there's a prediction. And then people can bet it's going to be over. People are going to be under. Kind of like the price is right when you're trying to get the, 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 the right price around the thing. But see, if it's over, like if, it's, if instead of 41, it's 42, and you bet over, then you win. You bet under, if you bet 34, then, then you win. Or if it's a, of course, if it's a soccer game, the prediction is like, though, it'll be, what, two, right? So... That's why American football is fun to watch. And never mind. Um, oh, now you ask, but what happens if they hit the number? Well, see, they've already figured this out too. What they do is they just they put the over under at like 2.5. So there's there's no chance of hitting the actual number. You're either betting it's going to be three or up for over, or two for under, right? So you you can go either direction there. Or again, soccer game maybe zero. But uh, I'm just, sorry about that. There's harshing on soccer today. Now, did the, now, why did this sports term for the over-under and, and betting on what, we've got a predicted score and then we're betting on the over-under, why was it in my head when I was prepping the sermon? Well, because I hope, as you'll see, the tabernacle is where God very specifically came and dwelt with his people in the Old Testament. And he actually interacts and relates and deals with them in an extraordinarily specific manner. We'll see from all the details, right? And you're going to see when it comes to that place, the Ark of the Covenant today, in the Holy of Holies, what it represents for God's people, and what it represents then as we understand its fulfillment now, we find ourselves with our own unique form of over-under in the way that God relates to us, and the problem is we keep betting on things over or under. And honestly, both of those are destined to lose. And the only safe place where we don't lose everything is right in that center spot that's not just been predicted but prophesied. And so I'll pray. And we'll get into things this morning. Father, we thank you for your word, and I pray you'd bless its reading today. And even as Nine Marks was talking about that exposition, may your spirit use me, but use each ear and each heart in this room to grow in the sanctification we confessed, we long for, and strive for together in your name. Amen. Well, again, a second week, as I mentioned with the kids, just for a brief review, where are we at? Right? Creation happened, the fall of man. God has made promises to his people. We've already passed Noah, God can, but man continues, of course, in his sin. God calls Abraham then and makes promises not just to build him a great physical offspring lineage, but to bless the whole world through him. And so Abraham trusts in God. Isaac then follows in the faith of his father. Jacob is, is renamed Israel. So we get that first idea of God's people, Israel. Joseph is taken to Egypt. 400 years there, the Israelites are now in slavery. God frees them through the man Moses. And then, and then last week, as I talked about, God instructed Moses to uh, pass the plate. Right? We, we had this beginning of the section. People give offerings for the construction of the tabernacle and everything in it that God's going to detail for Moses. And so we back up one verse 
and hit, chapter, or hit verse 9 in, in chapter 25, and we'll go through just 22. Just a short section. This series, we're not going to hit a lot of verses each week. We're going to keep it kind of tight and concise. It begins in verse 9. God says to Moses, Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold. Pure gold, inside and out, you shall overlay it. And you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, put them on its four feet, two rings on the one side of it, two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. Verse 17 begins, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work, shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end, one cherub on the other end. Of one piece of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another toward the mercy seat, and shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. And God's people said, Amen. Now, now before we get into the ark of the covenant specifically, the first thing you're going to see, that first fill in on your notes, I want to stop and consider something about this construct in its entirety, something that a commentator kind of blew my mind with about, about what we're thinking about and talking about and what it means. Uh, some of you might know this guy. Anybody know who this is here? This is James Raymond. He's one of our, our missions partners that we support, the Almeida Initiative. And here he is, actually, he just posted this on Facebook. Uh, where's he at? What's behind him there? All right, the Great Pyramids in Egypt. It's an amazing construct, right? How about this? Anybody know this one? Machu Picchu, okay. And how about the next one? Taj Mahal. Most people, by the time we get to Taj Mahal, okay, how about this one? Empire State Building. Empire State Building. To many, sort of the crowning achievement there in the New York skyline. Personally, I'm more of a Chrysler Building fan, um, but apparently King Kong loved it. So, um, so we could do this all day, right? And think of maybe you guys have something else. It's that what is like the coolest building? Maybe it's one of those in Dubai that's it's, it's strange. Or there's some pretty awesome looking structures in London, of course. My wife's a big uh, London Skyline fan, Big Ben, I mean, some other things like that. All of these pale in comparison to the tabernacle. All of these pale in comparison. Let's go back to the image. All of them. And I know you're looking at this, and you're like, okay, it's a tent, it's got a couple gold things inside. Why does everything else pale? Because the tabernacle is the only earthly building that has ever been designed perfect. Perfect. M.R. Dahan writes, the only building ever constructed upon this earth which was perfect from its very beginning and outset in every detail, never again needed attention, addition, or alteration was the tabernacle in the wilderness. The blueprint, pattern, plan, design, all its specifications were made in heaven. Committed to Moses, every single detail designed by the Almighty God. With every part, a prophetic and redemptive significance. God himself was the architect. What other building can say this? Dahan goes on to say, God himself was the architect. Every detail points to some aspect of the character and the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Probably the most comprehensive, detailed revelation of Jesus as the son of God in the entire Old Testament. That's what we're looking at here. Not just a cool box, not just something that was neat in that movie Raiders Lost Ark, right? That, that's not, we're talking about something much, much more. And then we begin not with the outside, right? We don't begin with the, even with the structure itself. We start with its main, most important for furnishing. And why? 
The great commentator named Umberto Casuto, he said, why does God start here? Because the tabernacle serves them. Serves these furnishings. They don't serve the tabernacle. The tabernacle exists to serve them. The tabernacle is detailed then from the inside out. That's what we're going to see over the next several weeks. It it didn't say, like, make this, and then inside there'll be these pieces of furniture. It's, oh no, from the inside out. That's the way God designs things. I, I think there's probably a lot of layers we could plumb from that if we stop and think about that for a moment. We start from the inward parts, most important, and work our way out to the outward parts. Anybody already see some symbolism there? As you'll see, the ark really is the pivot point for our very relationship with God and the central revealed work of Jesus Christ. And what about arks? The word used has no connection to Noah's ark, so it's not that same word. Well, I know another ark, Noah's ark. Do you ever think about, like, well, how does Moses just, he was like, build me an ark? Does Moses already have sort of an idea of what an ark is or is supposed to be? Yes, because God's using imagery and symbols. He's using, as we talked about last week, visual aids, which means they're understandable already to a degree by the people he gives them to. Arks, in other words, were not unique concepts. These were things that would have existed in their culture, kind of like we get into the New Testament. Baptism was being used before John the Baptist started using it. He starts using a symbolism that already exists. Arks already existed as an idea. What would happen in cultures is they would often contain, you'd open, okay, well, there's an ark, open it up, what's in it? Usually some form of covenant, and usually then the idols that ratify or go along with the covenant. So let's say, let's say I conquered your nation. Somebody would bring you an ark, and in it would be the, the idol I worship and the covenant law that you now live under because our my nation's in charge of yours. So you're both under this covenant or this treaty that we have, and by the way, here's, here's your God. That, that would be the idea. And so you would, that, on one hand, the idea then is relatable to Moses, but what is the absolutely radical difference? The singular distinction. What's not inside? Yeah, God. You don't put God in a box. God's not in the ark. The stark difference with the true God's ark is that he is not depicted or in any way supposed to be like, like he's stuck in there. You know, open it up. Oh, oh, there's Yahweh. No, how merciful and relational at all that he would condescend to dwell with his people and actually confirm that he'll actually dwell there above it, right there in their midst in a tent. How, how humbling and beautiful and merciful that he would even deign to do that. But where is it different? Like, you're not going to carve an image of me, and you're not going to stick me in that box. That he doesn't allow them to, think about even the way we use this term, he doesn't allow them to capture his likeness. Ever think about that term? Right? He's, he's going to, thou shalt not make graven images. That's why, honestly, at church, in a lot of Reformed churches, you don't see a lot of depictions of the Father, God the Father. Some don't even like images of Jesus, and they, they, that's, that's an interesting debate when it comes to things like a Jesus film or, or having the image in any form of even portraying Jesus. We, we would lean toward that's the incarnation. Yes, you can have a passion play. But when it comes to depicting God the Father, it's just best not to go there. Deuteronomy 4 actually is used, I mean, God actually expresses the, the divine imaging of him is prohibited. Some even believe, as, as we look at the golden calf, it's not that they were saying, let's make a whole new idol and forget about Yahweh. They were carving a calf to represent him. Like, that's just twisted. That's not the way it is supposed. God says, do not make an image that is supposed to be a God worship, like not even of one that's supposed to represent God himself. So we have to, God is set apart, and we see, even in the way this ark differs from the usual cultural standard for arks in that Middle Eastern vein, God is making this distinct. And speaking of that, what's also distinct? It says the poles are to be what? Permanent. All right, you should make poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold. Like, they, they should stay there. They're dedicated. Now, some people will... Real sticklers and nitpickers will notice in, in uh, Numbers, I think it's Numbers, numbers 4, 
actually talk about like they may have slid them out to put the cover cloth on for travel, but then they get like, in other words, they were never supposed to be taken out and set aside, used for anything else. They're dedicated, and generally they just are, remain in there. Now, why? Why do you suppose that is? Has nobody supposed to touch it? The poles are lethal. Oh, sorry, not the poles. The poles are the ark are permanent because the ark itself, after it was constructed and now dedicated to God, you don't touch that thing. God is holy and set apart. Even though he's not in the box, the fact that he would dwell, his presence would dwell above it, like it's, it's, it's equi- the equivalent to holy ground. Like You do not touch this thing. God's presence is right there. It dwells. And so we, we know this from later scripture. Where there's, in 2 Samuel 6, some of you may remember the story. David decides he wants the ark to be moved. And for some foolish reason, as things come together, it winds up being moved. Do they carry it by the poles like they're supposed to? Think about it, by the way. I was talking to Kat about this earlier. You're supposed to carry it like the poles on your shoulders. Have you guys ever seen like a movie from old times? Who else usually gets carried on the poles like on a seat, on the shoulder, royalty. Like, you're supposed to carry this, and, and not as if God is in the box, but it is the footstool of the king, and it'll, like, you carry it above. You carry it like you're carrying the king. You treat his mercy seat and the contents and the, and the cherubim and the fact that he dwells right there above it. You treat it like royalty. But instead, they put it on an ox cart in 2 Samuel 6. They treat it like they're, they're moving it like a U-Haul. And then, of course, something, the, the, it shakes, and a guy reaches out. Oh, it's going to tip over, and he touches it, drops dead. His name was Uzzah. And David's terrified. He's like, what have we done? I've, I've upset God. Well, yeah. Anger of the Lord was kindled. And the reason for this is because the ark was supposed to be, it is an earthly symbol of a heavenly reality. As we, as we talk about the tabernacle, everything, what we're really dealing with is the ark and even all the accoutrements, like, This is an earthly symbol God's giving us to help us understand heavenly realities. You don't put this thing on a cart like it's a piece of furniture. Priests carried this symbol as that earthly king would have been carried. And so, again, he says, you're going to make... Notice it's not even the outside that's just lined in gold to look good from the outside. The inside's lined with gold. You make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half. It's, like, it's basically like three feet by four feet. You know, sometimes I think we see it and we, it's huge in our mind. As a kid, I probably thought it was like eight feet. Like, no, this is surprisingly kind of just a small thing, relatively. And yet here he says, this is the place I will meet my people above the mercy seat and flanked by angels. Again, this is a visual aid to help us understand what heaven is like. Psalm 99 tells us, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth quake. Right? This is what heaven is like. If we were to actually get the veil removed and, and actually see God in His glory, well, or in my, right, I would die, but if we were standing in glory someday, it's like God is on the throne flanked by, surrounded by angels under him. That's like the heavenly reality, and then he meets us there. Tradition holds the cherubim, by the way, were often depicted with it culturally in ancient times there. Cherubim would be lion-like body with wings and a human face. Like this is not, these are God's palace guards, not little cherubs like we, like little babies with wings sitting on clouds and harps. Like think what's the difference? Like think about the angels you normally see in cute little pictures, and then imagine. Oh no, wait! These are like lion bodies with human heads and wings. Like this, actually, pretty shocking, right? When we think about when people meet God's messengers, they're so floored. They literally get floored. They're down on their knees. They almost try to worship these things, and they're told, "No, no, no! Worship God alone." Like, these things are intense. And so it's like God stoops down. Here we have, it's like God stoops down, leans in, and whispers between those wings to Moses. Whisper, talks to his people. Above the ark is his throne. The ark itself, Psalm 132 would tell us, is his footstool. 
Isaiah 66 actually, what does Isaiah 66 tell us is his footstool? The earth. So in a very real way, it's like God is condescending. That's the way that word, he's very kindly descending to speak to us. Here we are at the earth, the angels, God, and he's but he's coming down and in his presence, he's speaking to us. It's, like it's just a visual aid for how he's actually relating to his people who he's saving. And what are they on? They're actually affixed to which piece? The mercy seat. And as it, to what we, we look at it, it's like, well, that's the lid, right? Like, well, it's called the mercy seat. Or if you really do some, some hefty translation work, you'll find that perhaps, as many scholars would say, one of the best ways to translate it would be atonement cover or atoning cover. Some of us, this should already start to be, whoa, that, I like that, that, ex- that brings some other words into play I know about. You shall put the mercy seat, you shall put the atonement cover on top of the ark, There I will meet you, and from above that seat, from between the two cherubim, I will speak to you, and I will give you commandments. It can also, the term, it it could be, obviously it's a physical heavy gold lid. It's also the idea, it could also be uh, atonement cover. I mean, the cover idea could be a cloth, something covering, but it's related to atonement or mercy. It's actually a word that would fit the term when you hear that term propitiation, that God makes propitiation for our sins, to pay a price, to atone, to appease, to make peace. Now here's the question, even though he hasn't told us yet, some of you probably already know, in fact that little video pops open, what's inside, what is this seat literally covering? The Ten Commandments. Here he keeps, a couple times in this section, he tells Moses, the testimony I'm going to give you will be inside. The testimony I'm going to give you will be inside. And yeah, he's talking about, now he's about to give him the, right, we're going to wind up with some stone tablets. We're going to wind up with God's law. And so the placement of the testimony, it's like this goes in the ark. God reigns above. The testimony is below. And then there's a mercy seat. I want you to get that Get that God's over it. What's under that seat? We've got the law, and we've got a mercy seat covering it with angels. The whole idea, God's law is foundational. God's law is right there for the people. The law of God, also, also manna and Aaron's staff, and, and the law. So you've got, you've got an image of provision and of life and of law and all the ways it interacts with man on earth. Again, how do, we're on earth. We're basically, we're here at God's footstool. We come to the ark, which is also called his footstool. And just like we talked about arks earlier, the law is inside. It's the foundation. But the covenant is inside, not God. He meets them above it, and what's literally there in between, the atonement cover. Literally covering the law. And as we come to find out then in the ritual practice of the Day of Atonement, What is splashed over that every year on that cover? Blood. God rules, here we see, over the law. God rules over the law. The law is foundational. And every year, the Day of Atonement, there is blood splashed on that cover as an image of blood turning away His righteous wrath. We see that in Leviticus 16. John McKay would say, what is being covered here is the penalty demanded for infringements of those sovereign commands of a covenant king. I do have God's foundational law, which if I look in that box, I have broken. Israelites back then would know I've broken that law. Moses would remember, yeah, you were breaking it. I got so upset, I literally broke it. Threw the tablets down. A lot of breaking of God's law, and yet here even the design of the ark before his people can even understand it, there is an atonement cover and then a way that he will give them to foreshadow that blood needs to intercede here. And so God meets us and relates to us where atoning blood covers the law we've broken. 
those of you who know the gospel well, you're starting to say, oh, okay, this, this wasn't just these bizarre Old Testament rituals. Over the cover is God, so holy that to look at Him would kill us. Under is the law that condemns us. But in between, right in that sweet spot, the cover, the seat of mercy, there is blood that atones and turns away wrath, and we have safety from righteous judgment. There and only there. Hebrews 9 tells us, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So some, I hope, I hope we can all begin to understand as, as our children's ministry is teaching our kids the whole narrative of the Bible today, that even as we look at the Old Testament or we walk through these passages, we can see every place, in this case, this place of presence, this place of propitiation, this place where the people would plead with God to forgive their sins and offer sacrifices foreshadowing atonement. It all points to Jesus Christ. Again, Scripture, as we revisited Hebrews 2.17, said, Therefore He, Jesus, had to be made like His brothers, like us, in every respect, so that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. There's that word again, the atonement cover, the mercy seat, the place of propitiation where there is peace and satisfaction made with God. So Jesus is the priest that makes that propitiation, and more weight, 1 John 4 says, in this is love, not that we've loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation. Okay, wait, so He's the priest that makes it, but He also is that propitiation. And now wait for it. Hebrews 2 tells us, but we see Him who for a little while, think about the image of the ark when I read this. This question gets asked a whole bunch of times. What does this mean? Hebrews 2 tells us, but we see him who for a little while, Jesus, was made lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Lower than the Do you see it? Do you see it? Jesus became, God incarnate came and dwelled with us. Let's see the next picture of the ark. What does Hebrews tell us? He became lower than the angels. He's the atoning cover. He became lower than the angels. Jesus is the atonement cover. He is covered in blood. God the Father sent His Son to be lower than the angels, to be the atoning cover. Fulfilled the law perfectly. He's standing on that foundation. He satisfied it perfectly. But he's literally in this visual aid, lower than the angels, standing, fulfilling the law, and offering atonement as through his blood, paying the price for sin and death on the cross. This is where God meets us, and we can be reconciled. At that perfect place of atonement, we're forgiven. This is God's visual sermon set up a thousand plus years in advance of Jesus' coming. And we need to be right there. You and I need to be right there. Not with a physical ark, but with what we understand it was painting as an image and representing. And the problem is, so many of us keep betting on the over-under. Right? God didn't just predict a score. He's like, this is the only way. This is where, this is the point. It's Jesus. And we keep betting on things that are over and under. There's nothing to wager on, folks. How, how are we doing the over-under in betting? How, does the, how do we do it as the world? We either overestimate our own works, overestimate our own worth. Hey, God, I should get in. I'm going to bet on me. I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I've been pretty good. I worked at following your commands. It wasn't Hitler. Right? Some of us, we expect to get up there and say, I mean, I mean let me in. I, I, I'm basically good, right? I gave to some charity. I did some stuff. That's actually, so many even professing Christians in America today believe this. You know, how do you get to heaven? Well, I need to be a good person. No! That's not how you merit salvation at all. The Bible says the exact opposite. Not by human will or exertion. Not by works. By grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. 
In fact, we talked about works with our confession, talking about sanctification. Works and fruit are there, but that's, that's not what's meriting me any salvation. It was, it was tragic this last week. I saw an interview with Bruce Jenner. I'm sorry, Caitlin. Sorry, not sorry. Actually talking about his, actually talking about God. Of all the things in relation to his life choices, I saw this quote in an interview. He said, after a long thought, I said, you know what? At this point in my life, my kids are raised. Everybody's fine. Maybe it's time I take care of myself. Because when that day comes and you go off to the pearly gates and you're walking up the stairs and you're seeing God in front of you and you just ask that question, did I do a good job? Did I do the right things? I just hope he says, hey, come in. I did a good job. That's tragic. God is not going to say come into heaven because I did a good job. God is not going to say come on in because you did a good job to any of us. Did I do a good job? That's the wrong thing to say. I get up to gates, I say, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. I do not deserve to be here at all, but my hope is in Jesus Christ. And you can't just say that like a magic phrase to get in. You have to mean it, you have to believe it. Your life will certainly show if you do. But there's, there's the other side then. There's the other undervaluing side where we bet on this loosey-goosey kind of mealy mouth grandpa God who just sort of... No, I mean, yeah, sure, we all screw up. Come on in, though. I mean, sin isn't that big of a deal. We don't really understand the cross. We don't really understand Christ. We don't really understand repentance. We underestimate sin, and we underestimate God's justice and His righteous wrath. We're like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of a screw-up, but, you know, he'll wink when I get up there and say, well, we all make mistakes, right? Right? I mean, I'm a, everybody sins, but I'm a God of grace. I'll just, here's heaven's rug. We'll sweep it under and just come on in. Let me wipe that sin off your shoulder like it's you know, just a bit of lint. No, there is blood, people, splattered on that ark. I know some of you get queasy. I didn't pull up any pictures of it. But sometimes I do think we're a little worth, worse off in the 21st century without that visual aid. Easter weekend, what do we have? We have eggs and bunnies. When we should have blood. Every year, some people think about God's people for years and years and years. Some people, their entire lives, they spent growing up, whether they were there at that first Passover when an animal was killed and dad brushed the blood over the doorpost, or then when they were aware of the sacrifices going on and there'd be this cute little lamb that would get gutted. They understood the weight of of sin which actually caused conviction and repentance in their hearts not just an idea that grace was a get out of hell free card that I get to pull out and be like hey I knew the Jesus story that, that's not what it's about from the first Passover to the day of atonement something was killed bled out Exodus 24 right before our series started here in chapter 25 says Moses took the blood and threw it on the people at their worship service, there was a splatter zone. He said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. That's, that's our God. That's, that's the same God, people. He had blood splattered on his people to emphasize his point. God meets us through blood, reconciles us through blood, foreshadowed with the ark here and fulfilled with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We're not going to get into heaven because we think, Ah, my little sins don't matter. There's no cheap grace. Someone died for that sin I'm sloughing off is no big deal. Dietrich Bonhoeffer defined cheap grace as the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. And we, we don't do that here. We're not saved by the law or our works, and we're not saved by a God who just shrugs and and just lets our sin go. No, there was a heavy penalty that should convict my heart. This should chasten me when I think I can just habitually keep on sinning and be unrepentant. Jesus' first thing he proclaimed in Mark was repent and believe in the gospel. That, without true conviction of our sin, without true recognition of what Christ did on the cross, we're undervaluing the call and need to live a life of faith and repentance. So that's the shape 
of things designed in tangible form thousands of years ago for God's people to start to grasp visually from Moses to May 30th at Refuge Church. Friends, all wagers are off. There is no over-under with God. There's, there's no bet to be made. There's only, here is the score. Believe this will be the score. The only way, t- way truth, and life is through Jesus Christ. The only point, points that matter, one point, Jesus. The only sure bet. God's above him when he's on the cross. The angels are bearing witness. He's over that law he kept perfectly. He played a perfect game. Right there under his atoning cover is where we need to be. Right there. Here's the score. Believe in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Come to him. He provides atonement. Live your life for him and worship him and you'll know eternal life. There's no other way to victory. Amen? The good news is Jesus already triumphed and in him we can share the victory forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that that you meet us what, when I consider the heavens that you have displayed in such a grandiose manner for us to witness in the 21st century, I can't even imagine why you're mindful of me, why you're mindful of mankind, why, God, if, God, if you were not real, this would be an insignificant planet with things ultimately on a galactic scale smaller than fleas. And yet you say we have value and worth, eternal worth. Eternal worth as your image bearers, eternal worth as servants, eternal worth as children. God, thank you for that reality. Convict us of all the ways we take that for granted who are Christians. Help us to grow and encourage us in our sanctification to not take our sin lightly or to take our good works lightly to pursue them with passionate hearts and diligent minds. And for any who are not in you, God, I pray that they would put their hope and faith and trust not in a God who will turn a blind eye to our sin, and not certainly in our own works that you're going to tell us we did good enough to get in, but a God who loved us so much He sent His Son to pay the excruciating price for sin, no, no taking it lightly so that we would respond like heartfelt, gracious, grateful, loving children to our God and our Father. In your name we pray. Amen.